Never put personal identity information on a blockchain. It's a bad idea. Blockchains are encrypted, but you're tempting fate. Keep private information off the blockchain, but use the blockchain as a marker for proofs and permissions. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So my first question is, my first question is about a panel today on which Marie Week from IBM said the following. Permission blockchains for a fit for purpose, bring your ecosystem, scale the data you want to share is perfect for use cases like trade, like you know, provenance. Um, but permission doesn't mean private. Can you elaborate on that distinction? Yeah, so one of the things we do at IBM is we uh, co-create and we produce a blockchain software for enterprise. Mm -hmm. The funny thing about the software is it doesn't have a conscience. It doesn't know if it's being deployed in a public, private, permission or permissionless right. way. But the technology is very flexible based on beholders, like a trade finance consortium, it can be, implement, it can be deployed uh, in many interesting ways that are appropriate for that use case. The technology that we produce around Hyperledger Fabric mm -hmm. is what we call a permission blockchain. Um, it's not a private blockchain, it's not a public blockchain. It is whatever the users of it make it. So it's not for us to say. Now, you might ask, what do our users do? Mm -hmm. Well, most of them have a business network, um, a, a supply chain network, a trade finance network of groups that typically work together. Um, and they're known entities to the network. So that's how they implement uh, our technology as uh, permission so that the members are, are accountable, but still they can interact privately. They can make it public and set the rules for what it takes to join and get your permissions, get your membership like card. Like no rules. Yeah, yeah. or they, right. can put, they can turn all the rules off. The technology doesn't know. It's quite you know, accommodating. But most of our customers do turn some rules on and govern the network accordingly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I recently saw a panel at a different conference between someone from EY and someone from Consensus with a Y, and who was formerly IBM. Um, and they were talking about this sort of debate between using public versus private blockchains, yeah. whatever. And they both agreed on use the fact that it's important to use the Ethereum blockchain in particular. So a public blockchain and then in particular Ethereum's mainnet. And had kind of like come to that from this enterprise yeah. perspective. And so what do you, yeah, what, what are your thoughts I, I on that? I do think maybe? it's, it, I think networks it's critical that, that networks work with networks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a profound thought. It just, it's as simple as any mobile app today um, uses at least 12 APIs from different services. You know, if the, if the app um, is going to make a payment and then uh, text the person that the payment was sent, mm -hmm. they'll use maybe a PayPal API and they'll use a Twilio API to send the text. Blockchain is no different. So uh, enterprise applications are going to use other services from other networks. So it's not a crazy thought. It's a pretty grounded thought in 20 years of software integrating with software. So I don't think it's a crazy thought that a public network like a Stellar network substitute what I just said about PayPal and int introduce Stellar to make a payment. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm -hmm. Ethereum itself? I mean, Ethereum is a world computer. It can be anything. So you can build all kinds of applications on that world computer and an application in a custom network wanting to call, I can see it. Now, I don't, based on our clientele, while that might be something that's happening in the future, I don't hear a lot of folks who are grounded in building blockchain solutions today asking that question yet. Which question? About you know, custom networks oh, okay. talking to Bitcoin or Ethereum okay. or others. Not yet, at least. But I do think, uh, because they're focused on making their dream blockchain consortium come to life. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, in anything, technology is just one piece. Where I see our customers struggling these days is maybe 20% on the technology, mm. but the remaining 80% is on business and legal. And those yeah. business and legal conversations transcend you know, the networks. Um, but it really helps then um, to 
focus in on a single governance model because now your business and legal frameworks could at least be contained before you start adopting other business and legal. Mm -hmm. Just imagine the click-through agreement in that network when you're going to accept the terms and it's like this part is running on this custom network, that part is running on Ethereum. You know, so I do think the perspective is that's, that's an interesting thought. I think it's grounded in precedence, things that have precedence. But I don't hear any of, of our clientele asking for that just yet. Okay. So what are your clientele asking for? What are the main things that enterprises are looking for when they're looking to implement blockchain in some way? Four things. Okay. Um, they're interested in accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, many of these, like a, uh, a consortium of drug companies looking to eliminate uh, counterfeiting from the drug supply chain. They're going to count, care about accountability because there are rules like HIPAA in, the, in mm -hmm. healthcare, and it's good for you and I that those companies follow those rules, right? Right? Or GDPR, like for privacy, uh, respecting uh, end users' privacy. Next is while you need to be known to the network, you want our customers are asking that they can confidentially transact on the network without everyone else having knowing everyone's business, mm -hmm. right? So many networks um, in blockchain support a broadcast model where everyone gets everything, mm -hmm. but to be able to subset for different class, for certain types of transactions, our customers are saying, can we kind of like create little, uh, we call them channels like in Slack, mm -hmm. where you can just set up a channel of an interest group right. and only those parties, parties are privilege to those transactions, mm -hmm. so privacy is number two. Number three is an insatiable appetite for performance. Immense transaction volumes in the thousands of transactions per second, and no matter all of our breakthroughs that we come up with, and we're coming up with them regularly as a community, they want more. Mm -hmm. And then the other is fault tolerant security. Um, when you have six institutions coming to the table, or 12 or 25, not all of them are at the same investment level. So they want to make sure that a careless action on, and I would say not a nefarious action, it's probably more care, careless versus a set of permission uh, institutions, that if someone forgets to upgrade their machine, that that can bring the whole consortium down. So what about uh, the issue of scalability, which you just mentioned? How is Hyperledger working on that? Yeah, so one of the things um, that I love about the Hyperledger community and, and kind of incited by the Linux Foundation and how they've run the Linux Foundation over the past decade and more is it breeds a fierce setting of collaboration and through a modular architecture in Hyperledger Fabric, uh, while we're collaborating on the core, we are also at the same time, through modularity, adding our own value and then fiercely competing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we all benefit from, for example, I would say about a month ago, University of Waterloo and in Canada mm -hmm. uh, did a study on Hyperledger Fabric performance and found that um, if they create swim lanes for different types of transactions, things could move a lot faster. And they took a use case, one of their examples, that they were running at about three or 400 transactions per second and got it to run at 20,000 transactions per sec second. When I read the paper one morning, it just kind of came into the community out of nowhere, seemingly. Yeah. It was like Christmas morning for me. <laughs> I was like, wow. And that's the fierce collaboration that you get under the uh, Hyperledger kind of umbrella. Cool. Um, you know, fierce competition because fair governance um, liberal licensing, encouraging secure software mm -hmm. with many eyes looking at it, and modularity to allow businesses to differentiate and offer services that folks will pay for on top of the free software so they can get paid and invest more in the open software, etc. Right, okay. What are the. So you recently published, IBM recently published this five principles, yes. I believe, of yeah. blockchain. Can you just summarize what they are? We've seen blockchain used for less wholesome things. Yeah. Um, ICOs that aren't backed by anything more than a two-page white paper that fold up, but you know, I, you know, 
like anything else, the technology doesn't have a conscience, as I right. said before. It's the people who use it that do. So we have some principles um, that help people think about the proper use for this, mm -hmm. this technology, informed by our you know, four plus years working on blockchain. The first is, and we've talked about it, is open. Um, open by design is right. what Marie Week talked about this morning. Open just not as a you know, dump and run on your code. It's not about just that it's open source, but it's openly governed. The practices are fair and known. The community of contributors are, are diverse. Liberal licensing, mm -hmm. that's a really imp important aspect um, of, of, the, of the principles. The other thing is around um, uh, data ownership. Mm. The blockchain really doesn't mind what data you put on it. It doesn't discriminate. Right, right. But we advise um, the users of a blockchain to don't never put personal identity information on a blockchain. Mm. It's a bad idea. Um, yes, blockchains are encrypted, but you're tempting fate, right? So keep um, personal identity information off the blockchain, but put proofs and permissions. Use the blockchain almost like as a digital rights management system to allow people, for example, um, you know, if everyone's putting their, their personal information in a database, the database could be, you know, breached, there can be a data breach, and we've seen, like, you've seen this happen Well, we've before, seen it happen right? with centralized databases. Centralized databases, but if everyone keeps their personal identity information on their phone, mm -hmm. that's true. the likelihood in a wallet, in an in a encrypted wallet on their phone, while yes, you can lose your wallet next Tuesday, but the chance of everyone in New York losing their wallet on the same day, yeah. not likely to happen, right? right? So another principle is the data is yours, mm -hmm. not ours. Uh, so keep private information off the blockchain, hmm. but use the blockchain as a marker for proofs and permissions. Okay, um, so that you can have something like a blockchain-based identity that's right. solution yeah. or something, and KYC, it's, it's, but it's, it's like... Right, and it's less the blockchain is used for identity. We call it an identity blockchain. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that the blockchain is really a coordinator. It is, it is the uh, almost a legal verification mm -hmm. system. It, it issues credentials. It val verifies credentials. But they're not all kept there. The, but the proofs are kept there. Mm -hmm. The contracts are kept there. Right? And it's a very wise use. Last question is about these two events, I guess, in crypto markets that people, or in blo blockchain and crypto in general in the industry, people have been looking to two things. And this is sort of outside of the enterpri enterprise yeah. topic, but I'm curious what you think of this yeah. from your perspective. One thing is the launch of a Bitcoin ETF yeah. uh, in the US specifically. And the other is Backed the company backed launching, which will be you know they're from the New York Stock Exchange yeah. operator, so it's a big institutional move, and they would be launching Bitcoin futures. So do you, can you speak to those two events? Yeah. Is that something you pay attention to at all? I, it's funny. I'm a I'm a lifelong uh, software engineer, com computer scientist converted into a business leader at IBM <laughs> through the school of hard knocks. Uh, in blockchain world, you also get forced to be a bit of an economist. Um, thinking about, um, I would say, the whole uh, behavioral science of incentiviz incentivizing a, a mm -hmm. group. When blockchain, I like to say, is a team sport. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting to see how cryptocurrencies provide that incentivization of or how they incentivize a group to work. But other than that, again, I don't have a dog in that hunt, <laughs> but I'm intrigued by it, but I really don't have a real uh, one one thing to say, one or the other on okay. those events. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, that's all I have. Thank yeah. you so much for your no, time. Thank you. Great questions. That Appreciate was awesome. it. Yeah. yeah. Coin Telegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.